Hey guys, Mr. Birch here. Today we're going to be studying over the Young Republic and the Age of Jackson eras. So make sure that you have your study guide printed off, your survivor's guide. Get that printed off. Have it beside you on your desk with a pen and or highlighter marker, something to follow along and make notes as we go. Because we're going to be talking about some things that may not be on the survivor's guide and some things that you might want to make some notes on. Okay, if you don't have that survivor's guide printed off, Go to Mr. Birch's website, make sure you click on the star review page, and then go scroll all the way to the bottom. It says 8th Grade History Star Survivor's Guide PDF. Click on that and print that out. Um, once you've got that printed, then you'll be good to go. So press pause if you need to do that. Otherwise, let's get going. All right, so the Young Republic is just talking about the era at the beginning of the United States. Right after the Revolutionary War, we have formed our own government, our own United States, our own country, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. So the first few slides will be review, going over the packet together, and then the last slides, everything else we're going to be doing in the rest of the video, will be questions directly from Star, Quest, Star Test. All of these questions that you'll see are the entirety, like every single star question that's ever been asked over these two eras, okay? So there won't be a single star question over these two eras that you're not going to see today. Okay, so I figured we need to start by talking a little bit about the U.S. government. Um, so it was our, that was the beginning of our young republic, the government that we formed. So it was separated into three branches. The first branch is the executive branch. This is the president of the United States, the president has the power to veto legislation from Congress. That just means that when they send a bill or a law to his desk to sign into, um, into law, he has the option or she has the option to veto that law. Um, that law then can get back sent back to Congress and in both houses can be passed regardless of the presidential veto. If two-thirds of the vote is in favor of the law, it will supersede the president's veto. This is a form of checks and balances. The first president was George Washington. This is noteworthy because we've seen this on the test before. In his farewell address, he encouraged Americans to do two things. One, not to enter into party politics, which ironically the two men in his cabinet under him, Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson, kind of formed some of the first party politics in our government. But he didn't want us to do that. And then secondly, he didn't want us to enter into any permanent alliances or treaties with other countries. Um, he didn't want us to enter into these long-term alliances with other countries. He thought it would get us um, in trouble moving forward. Okay, so those are two things about George Washington and his farewell address. The second branch of government is the legislative branch. Elected officials from each state make up this branch, and it's called Congress. So if you hear legislative branch or Congress, same thing. Congress is separated into two chambers. These two chambers, this separating them into two chambers is what we call the bicameral system. Bi, like bicycle, two wheels. It's called the House of Representatives and the Senate. Those are the two divisions of Congress. So <clears throat> this happened because of what we call the Great Compromise. There's a lot of compromises in U.S. history, so pay close attention. The Great Compromise was when we allowed the small and the large states to share jointly in U.S. government and basically it just split the Senate into being a legislative body that has two representatives from each state. So every state is equal in the Senate. And then the House is made up based on each state's population. And that way the larger states, at least those with a larger population, have more representatives. If you have a smaller population in your state, you have less representatives. So it was kind of a compromise. All states are equal in the Senate. The larger population states have more representatives in the House. All right, the judicial branch is the third branch of the U.S. federal government. Judges in the Supreme Court make up this branch. There are nine judges. Here's a couple of the famous cases that you're going to need to know that appear on almost every star test. Marbury versus Madison. This was very early on in our country's beginning, so part of the Young Republic. And it established the precedent that the court would determine the constitutionality of laws. I know that's a big word. But this was otherwise known as judicial review. Judicial review is the idea that the Supreme Court 
are the ones that decide if the laws that the legislative branch creates are actually legal based on how our constitutional framework is set up. Another famous case that we see multiple times on the test is Dred Scott v. Sanford. This case decided by saying that slaves, Dred Scott, could not sue the government because they were only property. They were not people. And the judge that you might want to remember for this case is Judge Roger Taney. Um, very terrible case, of course. Um, eventually became overruled many years later, at least by um, different amendments. But this was just saying that slaves were not people or citizens of our country. They were property. A couple other governmental things here. Three-fifths compromise was agreed upon to consider slaves as only three-fifths of a person when counting populations of slave states. So each slave counted towards the state's, state's population, but not as a whole person. Again, another sign of how we treated the slaves in our country. Federalists wanted stronger central government. Anti-Federalists wanted more state rights and personal freedoms and eventually led to the Bill of Rights. We talked about checks and balances. It's the idea that the three branches of government will keep each other from having too much power. To check each other, like the presidential veto, and balance each other, like if the legislative body wants to override a presidential veto, they have to have two-thirds. And again, check each other or balance each other, like the judicial review process by the Supreme Court when they see a law that comes through legislative bodies, and they say, well, this law is not actually adherent to the Constitution, so we can throw it out. All right, a little bit more here. The Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments to the Constitution is called the Bill of Rights. So if you hear the Second Amendment, well, that's part of the Bill of Rights. Eighth Amendment, part of the Bill of Rights. Twelfth Amendment, not part of the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights is the first 10, okay? They were all introduced to our government simultaneously at the very onset of our government when just within a couple short years after the formation of our Constitution. So the Anti-Federalists, that was a group led by men like George Mason, George Mason and Patrick Henry. They strongly pushed for the rights of the people, and along with that, the signing, um, along with the signing of the Constitution, they eventually pushed for, and it eventually happened to where we got these Bill of Rights. So Patrick Henry and George Mason were responsible in a, in a large part for the, um, the Bill of Rights. All right, First Amendment. This one is the one that we see most often on the test, so just remember this. There's a lot of amendments to remember. I recommend that you look over them, but this one is the one that we see most often. Freedom of the press, that's part of the First Amendment. The press is uh, news agencies, anybody that's going to talk about the news for our country, right? Freedom of press, that's First Amendment. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, Freedom of assembly, that just means you can gather together, you can assemble. And freedom to petition, that means you can argue against our government or petition them for something. Those are all part of the First Amendment, which is the first of the ten Bill of Rights. All right, during George Washington's presidency, Thomas Jefferson, which was the Secretary of State, and Alexander Hamilton, Secretary of Treasury, um, they were the two that ended up forming what kind of became party politics that George Washington spoke out against. But Alexander Hamilton being the Secretary of Treasury, Treasury meaning he dealt with the finances and money of our country, his plan for the U.S. federal government to take on the debts of the states. After the Revolutionary War, George Washington found that our country was completely debt-ridden um, because of the war. Well, each state had debt, and Alexander, ha Handel Alexander Hamilton's idea was for the federal government to take on the debts of the states. He also wanted to form a national bank. So a compromise again was reached. The capital of Washington DC or the capital of the United States was moved to Washington DC which was in the south technically and that was kind of the southerners what they got out of it and the northern the northerners and Alexander Hamilton's group they got the fact that we got a national bank and the state's debts were removed. Second president, John Adams, he passed, this is one thing we've seen on the test, the Alien and Sedition Acts. This allowed the removal and imprisonment of immigrants and disallowed people to speak out against the government. This kind of goes against, well, the Constitution and our amendments, but this passed and was around for a short period of time based on John 
Adams and many other people in our countries, fear of possible war with France. We felt like there might be spies and people speaking out against our country. There was a lot of fear against immigration as well. So after John Adams, you have the third president, Thomas Jefferson. The most famous thing that Thomas Jefferson did to change the face of our country was the Louisiana Purchase. He bought this land from France, and it was the most massive land grab, land purchase in the history of our country. It was the whole center chunk of what we know of the United States today. The Missouri River was, was the river that was used to explore much of this land too, by the way. So the War of 1812 happened after, shortly after we are this new young country. We've already won our the War of Independence from, or the Revolutionary War from Great Britain. We had the Treaty in Paris, 1783. Well, by, se- by 1812, tensions had ridden, risen between the British and the Americans again, and a new war had broke out called the War of 1812. British stopped shipping products during this war to the United States for the most part. Great Britain was a leader in the Industrial Revolution at this time, And they produce things like glass, lead, paper products, um, all kinds of textiles, which textiles just means cloth or interwoven fibers. So anything that wasn't a simplistic handmade item made in the United States, most all of that was purchased from Great Britain. Well, when we're at war with Great Britain, we can no longer purchase these products. So this kind of forced America into an industrial revolution even further than they had already been. This forced the United States to produce more of their own products. It kind of helped us in the long term because we couldn't get them from Great Britain during the war. We ended up in the North mostly producing more and more factories and industry. All right, let's talk a little bit about a couple main topics that we always find on the test and then also immigration. So the Monroe Doctrine. The Monroe Doctrine came about during the Young Republic time in American history. This is the idea from President Monroe that no European countries, and it actually expanded later and later, but no European countries were allowed to come into the whole Western Hemisphere, that's all of North America, not just the United States, and all of Central and South America. What that means is that we made this doctrine, this belief system, this proclamation to the world, no European powers can come and colonize or create their own countries within the Americas. We were going to be the protector of the Western Hemisphere, or owner of the Western Hemisphere, however you want to look at it. That's the Monroe Doctrine. Okay, and we need to make sure we clarify between that and Manifest Destiny. Manifest Destiny, it's our destiny to to stretch our country from the East Coast, where we started, all the way to the West Coast. The sea to shining sea attitude. Things that... Things like Thomas Jefferson purchasing the Louisiana Purchase, the whole center part of the United States from Louisiana or from the French was part of this. We were gaining more land moving further west. And eventually the war with Mexico, thanks to James Polk and Texas, and then eventually the Oregon Treaty, getting the Oregon lands up in the far northwest of present-day United States from Great Britain. This is all part of this manifest destiny, moving further and further and grabbing more and more land. And by the way, the Mexican War ended and we got all of the lands of California, New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, Utah, parts of Colorado. Um, And you could kind of consider Texas part of that, but Texas came before the Mexican session. It's just that Mexico didn't think that Texas was independent. So anyway, we gained all of this land and that gain of land from Mexico is called the Mexican session. All right, so talking about immigrants. Four groups of immigrants we're going to focus on here today real quickly. The Irish immigrants, they came over because because of agricultural problems in Ireland and problems with with England, but specifically the potato famine. Their potato famine, well, potatoes was their main source of food with a massive famine. Just famine just means that they had disease in their crops and they couldn't grow any more potatoes or healthy potatoes, so they were dying of starvation. Many of the Irish immigrated around the 1820s and hundreds of thousands of of them came mostly to the northeastern part of the United States, some to the Midwest, but most of them in the northeast and they migrated usually to cities and urban areas and a lot of them worked in factories, a lot of them worked in canal building and um, 
and things like this in the Northeast. Okay, Chinese immigrants, they were complete opposite side of the country. They were on the far west. So if you think of the west, there's a lot of mining, there's a lot of expansion, the growth of railroads. Many of the Chinese immigrants worked in these fields. Working on things like, the thing that you probably need to remember most is that many of the Chinese immigrants, not all, but many, worked on the railroads in the western states, specifically California. That makes sense because the Chinese came from the west, so they landed on the west. The Irish came from the east, and they landed on the east. Um, another group of immigrants were the Germans. Throughout the expansion of the U.S., they were coming quite consistently, um, starting kind of, especially from 1820 onward, the test is in the past asked about very specific things about German culture, but one thing to note about German cultures, a lot of them settled in the kind of middle, the what used to be the middle colonies, a lot of them working in agriculture and farming and things. And then African slaves were another form of immigration. They were forced immigrants. They didn't come willingly. They were kidnapped and brought here and sold in, um, in the triangular trade between America, Europe, and Africa. So most worked on farms and plantations in the south, working to harvest cash crops, cotton, tobacco, sugar, rice, indigo, um, mostly king cotton. Some slaves escaped using the Underground Railroad to travel north to the free states and then later Canada. All right, so talking about the age of Jackson. Andrew Jackson was a common man and became president in 1828. Thanks to the recently expanded voting rights by lowering property taxes... Um, or property requirements and poll taxes. All this meant was Andrew Jackson, he actually ran for president in 1824. He didn't win the vast majority of the votes, but he did win more votes than any other presidential candidate in 1824. However, because he didn't win a high enough percentage, it went to the House of Representatives. They voted for another man to become president. Andrew Jackson felt like he got shafted in the deal. Four years later, when there's the next presidential election, Andrew Jackson wins because now Andrew Jackson was known as a common man, more common men, which in this case was just white men who own land, but more of these common men could vote because the new laws in place allowed more regular people, common men who own less land, they didn't have to be super rich land barons, they could just own a small portion of land and they had the right to vote. That gave him, Andrew Jackson, the quote-unquote common man, more votes, and he easily won the election in 1828. Okay, one thing to remember about Andrew Jackson was he stood up to men very strongly. He was a very bullheaded, strong-willed president. He overruled Supreme Court in some matters, specifically um, the Supreme Court ruling of the Cherokees in Georgia he told them that I don't care what the Supreme Court says, we're doing it my way, which ended up leading to the Indian Removal Act. That was Jackson's basically forcing the Indians or allowing the forcing of Indians from their homes in the southeast, so places like Georgia and Florida, forcing them from that land over to Oklahoma, you know, the state right above Texas. At the time, it wasn't a state, it was just territory. So this journey that eventually forced the Cherokee, mostly from Georgia, the Cherokee, Georgia, Florida area, the Cherokee had to be forced from their lands, and they went in the dead of winter, crossing the Appalachian Mountains, going all the way over to Oklahoma. This was called the Trail of Tears, um, because many of them died and starved along the way. The reason they wanted this land, the federal government, is because the white people wanted this land, the white Americans, they wanted this land for natural resources, good agriculture, gold was discovered. They wanted to gain wealth off the land. Okay, another thing about Andrew Jackson, the famous thing here, is the nullification crisis. There was a lot of taxes that, that were very difficult for the southern states at the time. Specifically, South Carolina did not like these higher taxes. They were federal taxes that, that impeded economic growth in the south, or they claimed that it did. So South Carolina wanted to nullify, which just means to negate or take away or remove this tax. They felt that it was an unfair tax, so they decided to nullify it. Andrew Jackson said, you cannot do that because we are the United States. We are one country. You can't nullify these taxes. So South Carolina said, we're going to leave the union. We're going to secede. That means leave the United States. 
um, as they eventually did many years later during the Civil War. Andrew Jackson expanded the power of president and forced them to pay their taxes and remain in the United States. Okay, Texas gained independence from Mexico after losing the Battle of the Alamo and finally winning the Battle of San Jacinto in 1836, soon thereafter joining as a state in the United States in 1845. Just a few other things of our early young republic here. During the early mid-1800s, people were moving to cities because of factory work and opportunities. People were moving west for land and riches, Oregon, California, this moving of people was helped by new trains, steamboats, and even communication increased by things like the telegraph invented by Samuel Morse. The thing to, to realize here is every time we built a canal, every time there was a new invention like a, the trains or the steam engine leading to the steamboats, all of these things expedited or speeded up travel, making travel easier, communication easier, travel faster and more efficient, which means that the costs and the prices went down because these new technologies made things faster and easier. So it made the prices go down. Okay, in the north, we just need to remember that there was a lot of factories, numerous fast-flowing rivers, and cities. In the south, plantations, fertile soil, cash crops, and slavery. And in the west, expansion, mining, minerals, ore, and then because of the expansion, new states. Quick overview of the timeline. I'm going to go through these quickly, so just stick with me. If you need to pause and make a note or kind of think over it for a moment, go right ahead. So 1787, the Constitutional Convention convenes in Philadelphia, and we decide the new structure for the nation, beginning the work on the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Okay, And then in that same year, the Northwest Ordinance, we see a question on this every test, by the way. It's just the how we established how new states would be inducted into the Union. Okay, That's the Northwest Ordinance how new states would be formed into our country. 1789, George Washington becomes the first president. 1790, the U.S. Constitution is ratified, means that it's signed into law, and establishes a new foundation for our country. That's kind of the framework of our country, right? The Bill of Rights is added to that very shortly after. Think of the Anti-Federalists were the ones who pushed for that, guys like Patrick Henry and George Mason. The Bill of Rights is the first 10 amendments. And then, so, just a couple years later, in 1793, Eli Whitney invents the cotton gin. Gin, just short for the word engine. It's a cotton gin. Well, it was used to speed up cotton harvesting, um, or the, co the cotton processing, really. Increase the, by the way, the cotton gin increased the quote-unquote need for slaves and the profitability of slaves. Because you could produce more cotton, so if you could get more slaves to pick more cotton, then you could produce more cotton, and then they would ship that off to the northern factories in the textile mills, and they would produce cloth out of it. So that the invention of the cotton gin increased the demand for slavery. Second President John Adams in 1798 signs the Alien and Sedition Acts, limiting the rights of immigrants and, and limiting the rights of speaking out against the government kind of restricting free speech, which is the First Amendment, by the way, because of fears of war with France. 1803, Marbury versus Madison was the Supreme Court case that established judicial review. We remember that judicial review means that the court decides what laws are and what laws are not constitutionally correct. And also in 1803, Jefferson arranged a payment of mi for millions of acres from the French for $15 million in what we call the Louisiana Purchase, largest land grab of U.S. history. 1812, that's the War of 1812. Kind of easy to remember that date, I hope. <laughs> Fighting the British leads the U.S. to build more industry and factories to produce our own goods. Well, the war ends with the Treaty of Ghent in 1815. By the way, during that war, the British actually invade the United States and actually end up burning down part of the White House. The Lowell Mills textile, or the Lowell textile mills and factories in 1814. So Lowell was a man who started these textile mills. If you remember, textile is just cloth or spun woven fabric. Most of it was from the cotton of the South. Well, these Lowell mills and factories, as we know, make sense. They're up in the North. This was mainly in Massachusetts, New Jersey, some of these northern states. 
Well, this played a major role in early industrialization, specifically in the North. Many of the workers in these textile mills were women and children. 1820, the Missouri Compromise. This was, we started to have these tensions between the northern free states, the southern slave states. Well, this was temporarily settling this debate. Each time we added a new state, the south wanted it to be slave, the north wanted it to be free. Well, the Missouri Compromise was kind of temporarily settling this. And it said that there was a line of latitude running east and west across our, our country for all new states. Anything over that 3630 line well, that would be a free state. Anything below it could be a slave state. All right, 1823, we talked about this earlier, the Monroe Doctrine introduced, stating that America would not allow the European powers to colonize or control any nations in all of the Western Hemisphere, North and South America. 1825, the Erie Canal is finished. It connects the Great Lakes and New York City. This actually opened up travel throughout the Northeast and really expanded the city of New York because more and more goods could go in and out and to market much quicker. The Erie Canal allowed for faster transportation and cheaper transportation because it was an easier, quicker way of travel. Remember I said that before, talking about as new technologies and canals and travel and communication got better, things got cheaper and they got faster. 1829, Andrew Jackson wins presidency. Remember, he's a common man, thanks to the voting rights expansion. He won because more common men could vote for their common man, which was Andrew Jackson. Remember, he pushed against the Supreme Court, and we're going to see one, a couple other things he did. First of all, the Indian Removal Act that moved the Indians from the native lands in the southeast and that forced them to the Oklahoma Territory so that whites could use the land for agriculture and natural resources. This eventually, because of the Indian Removal Act, led to the Cherokee having to leave, and then we call that journey that they took where many of them died and starved. It was a terrible, tragic journey. We call it the Trail of Tears. It kind of makes sense, the name there. Nullification crisis. That is, if you remember, when South Carolina said, look, we don't like these taxes. We want to repeal, nullify. We want to end these taxes. And Andrew Jackson said, no. As the President of the United States, you cannot leave and become your own separate state because we are a united states. They threatened to rebel. Jackson stopped them. All right, in 1836, the Texians who were fighting against Mexico trying to gain their independence, they lost the Battle of Alamo, um, but it kind of set up their ability to fight further, and they ended up winning the Battle of San Jacinto and became the Republic of Texas in 1836. That only lasted for a sh few short years because by 1845, I believe it was, Texas became a part of the United States. <laughs> they joined the Union. But for about nine years, they were their own country. Panic of 1837. This is also an Andrew Jackson thing. He was always fighting against the National Bank. Remember Andrew Jackson, or not, sorry, um, Alexander Hamilton, many years earlier, formed the National Bank. Andrew Jackson, being a common man, felt like the National Bank was only propping up and making the rich people richer. He wanted to end it. Well, the Panic of 1837 happened when he tried to shut down the National Bank, and an economic depression swept the country shortly after he pulled all the federal money out of the Bank of the U.S., the National Bank. Okay, 1845, the Irish potato famine happens, leading to a huge migration. Most settled in the northeast cities. Many worked in industry, and most of these Irish were Catholic. All right, so let's look at the couple maps. If you've watched the video before this, you've seen these maps, but we're going to look at them one more time. Quick review. The Appalachian Mountains there in green. We have the northern states in the, the dark pink at the top there. We have the middle states, and then you can see the southern states starting with like Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. You see here in the purple, that's the Indian Removal Act. That's the Trail of Tears. It's not just in that purple area, but you get the idea. It's in that main area. President Jackson forced the Indians, and you can see the arrows pointing there over to Oklahoma. The Ohio River Valley right there, that's the area that we talked about in our last lesson. British fought the French for the French and Indian War to gain that land. Also, by the way, if you can see my mouse up here, the Erie Canal connected the Great Lakes up here all the way down to New York City. 
Okay, this part's important here. The Northwest Ordinance, we talked about that at the top. It set the standard for inputting new states into the U.S. We also talked about Texas's independence from Mexico. It became its own country. They joined as a slave state, by the way, in 1845. Um, and Texas joining the United States helped spark the Mexican War because Mexico did not believe Texas to be independent. You can stop and pause and read over these if you'd like to, and we're going to move on. Young Republican Age of Jackson. So the following are about 45 questions going over every star question ever asked about this era. We're going to move quickly, so if you need to pause at any time in order to answer it yourself, like if I'm going too fast for you, I completely understand. I do want you to participate. Don't just sit back and watch. As I read the question, try to find the answer yourself. I'm going to be going much faster than you would on the star test. You have four hours on the star test. Please take your time. But we're going quickly here so that we can compress this into one video review session. One last thing before we start. On your star test, when you're doing test questions, you want to eliminate the answers that you know that you know are wrong. Eliminate the wrong ones. Now you're left with hopefully maybe just... A 50-50 chance, hopefully even better than that, you've eliminated the wrong ones and you know what the right answer is. But on this, as we're going today, it's going to be rather fast. You may not have time to do that if you don't pause it. All right, let's get going. Which problem did George Washington encounter when he became president? The United States had large debts from the American Revolution. Remember, I told you that we had large debts after the war, just like Great Britain had debts after the French and Indian War. America had debts after the Revolutionary War. Remember, that's when Andrew or Alexander Hamilton wanted to form the National Bank. During the 1800s, many young women in New England were employed outside their homes as... Cloth weavers in textile mills. With the growth of industry before and especially because of the War of 1812, industry in the North, all these textile mills spinning cloth and taking the cotton from the South up into the North into these mills and making fabrics, a lot of women and even some children worked in these textile mills. Again, if I'm going too fast, right after I read the question, hit pause. That way you have time to scan and decide the answer on your own before I go to, the, go to it. After the end of the Revolutionary War, states were eager to expand into newly available territory. The states of New York, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Virginia argued over competing claims to land west of the Appalachian Mountains. The conflict was addressed by the Northwest Ordinance. Remember, the Northwest Ordinance is the way that we decided how we were going to introduce new states into the Union. So that's how we decided this matter, the Northwest Ordinance. Gold was discovered on Cherokee land. Georgia annexed Cherokee land and abolished the Cherokee government and its laws. The Cherokees refused to move from their land. One attempt to resolve this issue without violence involved which action? The Cherokee Nation challenged Georgia's anti-Cherokee laws before the U.S. Supreme Court. Remember I told you that the Cherokee went to the Supreme Court to try to resolve this, but in the end it did not matter because Andrew Jackson, who was the president at the time, overruled the Supreme Court decision, and he ended up removing the Indians because thanks to the Indian Removal Act regardless. So he kind of stretched the powers of president overruling the Supreme Court. Speaker number one, a state has the right to overrule an act passed by Congress. After all, the national government is supposed to share power with the states. Speaker number two, I believe that you are wrong. The states do share power with the national government, but the Constitution says the national government has supremacy. These speakers are debating an issue that eventually became known as the... nullification crisis. If you think about this, this is talking about a state has the right to overrule an act passed by Congress. Remember South Carolina? They wanted to overrule the taxes um, 
And this, there's – so speaker number one would kind of represent South Carolina saying, look, we don't want to pay these taxes. We want to overrule this act. We want to nullify it. And then speaker number two might represent Andrew Jackson and the federal government saying, look, you're wrong. Yes, the states share power with the national government, but the Constitution says the national government reigns supreme over these states. The primary goal of the American Temperance Society was to decrease the consumption of alcohol. I do not have anything written on your survivor's guide about temperance. So please get out your pen right now. You might want to press pause, write down temperance. Not so anything about temperance that you're going to see on the test is related to the temperance movement, which was people saying we, you should not be drinking alcohol or you should very much limit your drinking of alcohol. Temperance movement, limiting the consumption or drinking of alcohol. It also got women very much involved in social reform. We have a map. We see Seneca Falls. A tourist would most likely go to the location shown on the map to visit the Elizabeth Cady Stanton House in Women's Rights National Historic Park. You're not going to see this exact question again. This one's very, it's one of those questions that might be there just to trick you, okay? I don't want you to worry about it, but we do want to know um, that the women's movement and the women's rights um, in the early republic, <clears throat> a lot of this was framed around a lot of social reform that took place, some of it because of the Second Great Awakening, which is a religious movement. And then the, what this did is it got people to be involved in social changes, things like the temperance movement, which again was the telling people to stop drinking as much alcohol. All right, after the War of 1812, thousands of settlers and immigrants moved to the western frontiers of the United States in search of farming and business opportunities. In response, the government began building roads. The transportation network was intended to promote the free enterprise system. Okay, this one again, you don't see free enterprise on your study packet. So you might, might want to make a note. Free enterprise system is just an economic system where people, businesses, and customers, and those producing and purchasing products or um, business services, they interact freely. Doesn't mean that everything is free. It just means that they interact freely. Nobody is limiting or restricting how business is played out. So the idea here is that the United States was helping produce roads and travel and remember the telegraph system so that we could have this free enterprise system and people could interact and participate in business and promote economic health in our country. So if you needed to pause that to write it down, do that. And then we'll get started here. British support of American Indians in the Northwest Territory. British impressment of American sailors. They both lead to the question mark and then eventually leads to the Treaty of Ghent. Which of the following best completes the diagram above? That's the War of 1812. I did not mention the two, two of the things that helped spark this war, but at least you do remember that the Treaty of Ghent was how we signed the treaty to end the War of 1812. The, end, the War of 1812 was the Americans and the British fighting against each other. Two of the causes were the British wanted the land in the far northwest of our country, in the Oregon area, area and they were supporting the American Indians in kind of pushing against American settling there. And then the British impressment of American sailors was on the seas in and near Europe where American sailors were being forced to become British um, sailors in their fighting navy. Not a good thing. That would obviously spark us to say you cannot kidnap our soldiers and make them our sailors and make them your soldiers. The first political parties in the United States were established in the 1790s largely because of Political differences between the 
Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton. Remember, they were both differing on their opinions as they were cabinet members under our first president, George Washington. Alexander Hamilton wanted a national bank and he wanted the federal government to take on all the debts of the state. Thomas Jefferson was more agrarian. He was thinking more that most Americans should be farmers and, and there should not be a big, massive government and big governmental power. Which of the following was a defining char characteristic of the era of good feelings? There was a renewed sense of nationalism, this national pride. This happened, the era of good feelings, feelings was right after the War of 1812. We won the war. There was kind of this sense in our country that, hey, we're going to make it. We can do this. I did not put that on your notes. You might want to write that too, era of good feelings, right after the War of 1812. That period there where Americans were like, wow, we really are a national power or a world power. We are significant. We're an American nation. How did the plantation system influence the economic development of the United States? It turned the South into a major producer of the cotton used in northern mills. So again, the plantation system was in the South. One of the biggest crops in the plantation system was cotton. The South produced the cotton. Well, and the northern mills are the ones that took that cotton and produced cloth out of it. I consider, then, the power to annul a law of the United States assumed by one state incompatible with the existence of the Union, contradict contradicted expressly by the letter of the Constitution. Proclamation, President Andrew Jackson. The proclamation exerted above was issued during which of these historical events? Even if we don't understand anything about this sentence, we can use process of elimination to understand that President Andrew Jackson was the president during the nullification crisis. But let's break it down here. It says the power to annul, nullify, annul. You see that connection there. To, to nullify a law, think about South Carolina wanting to nullify the taxes that were imposed upon them. And he's saying here, the power to annul a law of the United States assumed by one state, we know what state that is, South Carolina, is incompatible. It does not work with the existence of a union, the United States. It's contradicted. It's completely spoken out against in the letter of the Constitution. So he's saying the Constitution says it's illegal to nullify a law of the United States. That's Andrew Jackson speaking out against the nullification crisis. Which of these best summarizes the Monroe Doctrine? Further colonization of the Americas by European countries is prohibited. Remember the Monroe Doctrine was this idea that European powers, you cannot come over to our side of the world, the Western Hemisphere with North and South America here. You European powers, you stay out of here. Don't come over here and try to colonize or take control of pieces of land in our side of the world. We prohibited that. Finally, in the summer of 1842, after seven years of desperate warfare, an agreement was reached with a few hundred remaining Seminoles, allowing them to live in southwest Florida. John and Mary Lou Missal, A Short History of the Seminole Wars. What led to the conflict referred to in this excerpt? So this question is asking, what caused these conflicts? Think about it. The Indian Removal Act, as we tried to force Indians out of their land, Seminole was a group of Indians, by the way, as we tried to remove them, this caused much warfare. Remember I told you it was happened in Florida, Georgia, places in the southeast? Again, sometimes you may not know a word. word. Use your context clues and your knowledge of the story of history to to start to break down what makes sense, even if you don't know 
everything about a quote or statement. Don't panic. Begin to base your answer on what you already know of history and how this question works into your knowledge. Studying is the key. The second great awakening was a movement that promoted spiritual revival and the need for social reform. If you have not, if you're not sure on this one, I didn't put it on your notes, write it down somewhere. Second great awakening. It's it was a spiritual revival, a Christian revival that swept much of the American states, and what it did is it led to the people wanting to do social reform. Remember one example of social reform was the temperance movement, which was speaking out against alcohol consumption. How did the War of 1812 affect the U.S. economy? Manufacturing increased. Remember I told you that Great Britain could no longer was no longer sending us and selling us their products because they manufactured everything over there. When we're at war with them, they're not going to exchange things with us. So as that was limited during the War of 1812, in our economy, we said, okay, we're going to start manufacturing, creating, and building things ourselves. In 1832, the Supreme Court ruled that Georgia did not have legal authority over the Cherokees living in the state. President Andrew Jackson responded to this decision by ignoring the ruling and allowing Georgia to evict the Cherokee Nation. Even if you forgot all about this, if you just remember the fact that most often, if we're going to talk about Native Americans or Indians in our history, it's not going to be a good thing. But we know Andrew Jackson did the Indian... Removal Act, leading to the Trail of Tears. He overruled the Supreme Court. All of this of our knowledge of Andrew Jackson points to this one answer. The Northwest Ordinance is considered a historical milestone because it... ...established a method for admitting new states to the Union. <clears throat> Remember, this is just a memorized one. The Northwest Ordinance is how we admitted new states to the Union. According to Alexander Hamilton, which action was necessary to ensure the stability of the nation's economy? The establishment of a national bank. Remember, Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson were both cabinet members under the first president, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson later became the third president, but Alexander Hamilton never became president. Alexander Hamilton was the man who he and Jefferson kind of split into different parties later on for our po political parties. But Alexander Hamilton was really pushing to take on the state's debts and, be, and establish our own national bank. Relocation of American Indians in the 1830s. Then you see the map there, all these arrows pointing from the southeast over to Indian territory is what they're calling it up there. What was a major reason for the federal government's involvement in the relocations depicted on this map? To acquire valuable agricultural land and natural resources. So we wanted to gain this land because we wanted the land for agriculture and the White men wanted the land for natural resources, so took the Indians' land, forced them onto Indian territory, which was actually Oklahoma territory too, by the way. Leading members of President George Washington's cabinet. Wow, I just talked about this. Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson, Secretary of Treasury Alexander Hamilton. Disagreements between these two cabinet members led to... Yeah, the establishment of the first U.S. political parties. If you didn't know this one, then you shouldn't. You weren't paying attention to the last question because I already talked about this. The decision in Marbury versus Madison was significant in U.S. history because it it established the practice of judicial review by the Supreme Court. Remember Marbury v. Madison. That established judicial review by the Supreme Court. Judicial review means that the Supreme Court has the right to decide if a 
law is actually legal because that law has to coincide or exist within the structure of the Constitution. The Whiskey Rebellion, the Bank of the United States, the Alien and Sedition Acts, Marbury v. Madison, this list provides examples of Domestic issues faced by the leaders of the New Republic. This one can be difficult. <clears throat> the, Ris the Whiskey Rebellion was people in the western part of parts of the early, the first American states kind of fighting against George Washington and federal taxes that he imposed. And so Washington sent a group of troops out there to stop the Whiskey Rebellion. And before fighting broke out, they all said, okay, yes, sir, because he brought all of these troops out there. The Bank of the United States, remember, that was forming... The National Bank, thanks to Alexander Hamilton. The Alien and Sedition Acts, remember John Adams, second U.S. president. He was trying to figure out what to do with all these people who were in our country who were immigrants, who might be spies, they thought, or people who were speaking out against the U.S. government. Marbury v. Madison, remember that's the Supreme Court case where the judicial review was established. So these are domestic issues faced by the leaders of the New Republic. Domestic, think of a domesticated cat. There is a wild cat out in the prairie, and there's a domesticated cat. A domestic cat is a cat that lives in your house. A domestic issue faced by our presidents or anyone, a domestic issue would be something within the borders of our country. Okay, so all of these things are domestic issues. This one, you might have had to use context clues or eliminate some of the wrong answers to be able to figure out the right answer here. Which of the following correctly describes the three-fifths compromise? A portion of the slave population was counted for legislative representation. This one, I wish the answer would have been a little bit more clear, but nonetheless, it is the correct answer. The three-fifths compromise, you remember, it was that three-fifths of a person was counted towards the population if that person was a black slave. So if they were a slave, only three-fifths of that person counted. And it, it allowed for counting of partial of the population of slaves, but not all of the population of slaves as individuals for state populations. Which box lists some results of improved steamboat technology in the United States as of the mid-1830s? The price of fares decreased. Remember when I told you we got better technology, better transportation and communication, things got cheaper? The tourist industry developed. We didn't talk about that, but think about it. The better transportation, the more people can get out, things are cheaper, and they can become tourists. The cost to transport goods decreased. It's cheaper and faster to move things further. Well, the price of those things will become cheaper. The numbered river on this map played a major role in... The exploration of new territory acquired from France. Number one is where that river is. That's the Missouri River. It connects into the Mississippi River, which is the river immediately to the east of it up there north. <clears throat> That's the Missouri River. The Missouri and Mississippi Rivers combined are the largest river in our country. The Mississippi River technically is the longest. <clears throat> but this is the Louisiana Purchase Territory. It's that whole swath of middle area of our country purchased by Thomas Jefferson from the French in 1803, gaining the largest portion of land in our country's history at one time for only $15 million, which I think is kind of a steal. His foresight. You've got the picture below that. It says, Europe, you're not the only rooster in South America. Uncle Sam, I was aware of that when I cooped you up. The U.S. foreign policy illustrated in this cartoon was intended to... Prevent further European colonization in Western Hemisphere. Look closely at that image. First of all, Europe's saying, hey, you're not the only rooster in South America. And then Uncle Sam's saying, yeah, I knew that, but I cooped you up. 
So it's saying, what's the foreign policy illustrated? If you see there, it says Monroe Doctrine. Monroe Doctrine is what this policy is. Even if it didn't say that, we understand the concept because the Monroe Doctrine is the doctrine that says, Europe, you can't come to any parts of the Americas and take any land. That includes South America. The presidential election of 1824. Andrew Jackson won the most votes in the Electoral College, but he did not have a majority. Under the 12th Amendment, the decision was turned over to the House of Representatives, which elected John Quincy Adams. Jackson's supporters called Adams' election the result of a corrupt bargain. What was one effect of these events in the eight, on the 1828 presidential election? Well, in 1828, because of most people voting for Andrew Jackson or the more votes going for Andrew Jackson in this 1824 election, people wanted him to win, but he still didn't win because of the House of Representatives and the corrupt bargain. Well, voter participation increased in 1824 or 1828 afterwards because more people were there to vote for President Andrew Jackson. Remember I told you that they had made the laws a little bit more lenient about property ownership as well, and that helped get the common man, Andrew Jackson, voted by the common man, voted him into president. What was one major effect of the Second Great Awakening? People were inspired to join reform movements to address social problems. The Second Great Awakening, don't even worry about the first one, I've never seen it on the test. The Second Great Awakening was in the early 1800s, started in actually in the late 1700s, throughout the early 1800s. This Christian, religious, going back to your roots revival type of thing that spread through the Americas. Well, people were inspired because of their new religious fervor, they were inspired to join movements to address social problems in our country. Things like the abolition of slavery, the removal of slavery. Things like the temperance movement, stopping people from drinking so much. Later, the suffrage movement. The War of 1812 begins, blank, U.S. manufacturing expands. Which statement best completes the diagram? The supply of British goods decreases. The war begins, British stuff because we're fighting the British, the British stop sending us much, as much stuff, so the British goods decreases, then we begin to increase our manufacturing. Which shaded state was the main destination of American Indians forced to relocate as a part of the Trail of Tears? That'd be Oklahoma Territory. It's Oklahoma today. At the time, it was just territory. Indians were moved from the southeast up to Oklahoma Territory. How did the War of 1812 most affect the U.S. economy? Disruption in trade contributed to domestic industrial growth. Remember, we said domestic is within our own borders. Industrial growth, just like a couple questions before, there was less manufactured goods coming from Great Britain, so we started manufacturing in our own, our own things and our own industrial growth. The cotton gin. How did this invention contribute to the expansion of the plantation system? By increasing the profitability of slavery. Remember I told you earlier that <clears throat> because of the cotton gin, we could produce more seedless cotton. We could get the seeds out of the cotton faster. So if there was more slaves to pick more cotton, you could produce more cotton, ship it up north, and so it became more profitable to have more slaves because you could have more cotton. The more slaves you had, the more money you made, thanks to the cotton gin. Daughters of Temperance, Women's Christian Temperance Union. How did the growth of these organizations most affect the role of women in U.S. society? This is just kind of goes back to the Great Awakening too, influencing this. But temperance, again, we knew that temperance means that they were fighting for people to stop drinking alcohol as much. Well, it expanded the participation of women in social reform. Social reform is just society. We're trying to change or alter society. We're trying to make it better. Well, 
these women were participating in things like the temperance movement, and that was social reform. The Northwest Ordinance established guidelines for the orderly expansion of the United States by instituting a This one's a straight up question and answer. The Northwest Ordinance was a process through which states could be added to the Union. During the 1830s, public servants and officials were widely received, perceived to be unqualified. What practice reinforced this perception? The president rewarding political supporters with a Appointments to desirable positions. Only question I've seen on this on any star test, but it might be on there again. Just think about how things happen today. Somebody helps you get into the presidential office, then you try to help them out. Well, this kind of was going on back then. It's going on today. And people were thinking, uh, these public officials and public servants, they might not be qualified. They might have just got that position because they helped so-and-so get into such-and-such -such position. The Twelfth Amendment established a new process for choosing a president and a vice president. The purpose of this amendment was to reduce the likelihood of disputed outcomes in presidential elections. So it's to keep there to be this questionable situation of who the president and the vice president is because at one time it was the one with the most votes became president. The one with the second most votes became vice president. Well, that was very controversial and very conflicting in many ways. And so the 12th Amendment was established so that we could decide who would become president and vice president in a more orderly manner. It's the only question I think I remember seeing that's directly asking you what the 12th Amendment does. But even if you didn't remember the 12th Amendment, it's telling you choosing a president and vice president so why would they alter this? Just use your context clues the best that you can here. Eliminate the ones that you think are incorrect. The power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved for the states, respectively, or to the people. Tenth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Conflicting interpretations of this amendment played a role in the Nullification crisis. Think about the nullification crisis. It was the federal government and Andrew Jackson versus a state trying to do what they wanted to do. So this is talking about the powers of the United States versus the powers of the states. Well, the conflicting views of this 10th Amendment were shown in that nullification crisis. The first political parties in the United States formed mainly in response to disagreements over That's the extent of federal power. Remember I told you you had Thomas Jefferson on one side, you had Andrew or Alexander Hamilton on the other. One saying that there should be more federal power, that's Alexander Hamilton. One saying that there should be less federal power. Um, but also think about the anti-federalists before them, Patrick Henry and George Mason. They were saying that, look, the federal government shouldn't have so much power. And then other federalists were saying, yes, they should have more power. Regional economic activity in the United States in the early 1800s. You have the Northeast produced manufactured goods. The Midwest supplied food resources. The South provided raw materials. What was one result of these regional differences? Immigrants settled in the Midwest to establish small farms. This is, again, another unique question that I think is kind of a gotcha question because it's not something that's prominently talked about. But we t I did tell you that, if you remember, the Germans settled a lot in some of the Midwest areas to establish some small farms. Um, again, what you need to do here is look at these other examples and see, eliminate the wrong ones. Even if you didn't know what the right answer was, all the rest of these don't make sense. They are wrong. So that leaves you with only one answer that can be right. Tis our true policy to steer clear of blank with any portion of the foreign world. So far, I mean, as we are now at liberty to do it. But in my opinion, it is unnecessary and would be unwise to extend them. President George Washington's farewell address, 1796. Which phrase completes this excerpt? 
Tis our true policy to steer clear of blank. Remember I said George Washington wanted to steer clear of permanent alliances with any portion of the foreign world. He didn't want these permanent alliances. In Marbury v. Madison, the Supreme Court established a principle that would eventually be used by all courts to... Yeah, it's called judicial review. The Supreme Court and all courts could overrule things if that law was deemed unconstitutional. So the law has to line up with our Constitution. Any law has to line up with our Constitution for it to be allowable and effective. Alexander Hamilton's plan to improve the U.S. economy. The federal government would assume state debts. The federal government would... Which action completes this diagram? Yeah, Alexander Hamilton. The federal government would establish a national bank. Major 19th century innovations, agriculture, mechanical reapers, combine harvesters, steel plows, grain drills, industry, interchangeable parts, power looms, steam engines, Bessemer process, the innovations in agriculture and industry resulted in more efficient production of goods. If you look at all these things, this is the only one that makes sense because all these things made your production of these things faster and cheaper. It made it quicker, easier to produce more things. It's a more efficient process. All right, guys, that's it for today. Make sure you kind of read these last two slides on your, uh, on your packet at some point. If you need to, go back through this video. Watch all of these videos on all of the eras, okay? This will be very important and helpful for you. If you watch each one of these videos on the eras and pay close attention and then study your packet and study it well, you're going to do great on this test. Otherwise, I'm telling you, as I've told you before, this test is very, very difficult. If you do not prepare very well and very thoroughly. It's going to be a challenging test at best. But continue to do what you're doing. You've watched this video. You've done a good job. Keep it up. You're going to be in great shape if you keep doing that. Thank you guys.